These singular moments change the course of someone's life and thus history that follows. I'll take it one step further. If you hadn't come and contacted me 16 years ago, you wouldn't have been writing about the Stoics and people wouldn't be reading about Marcus Aurelius. Yeah, this is pretty cool. Thank you all for coming. This is very cool. So what we're going to do is Robert and I are going to talk for a little bit, and then we'll open it up to questions from all of you. And uh, we'll do this. Where should we put that? Well, I hold it here for security just so I don't fall. And you can tap it for emphasis. <laughs> and I get really angry. <laughs> yes. um, I thought we should start with our mutual first love. A thing I think some people think is dry or dusty or boring, although if they thought that, they probably came to the wrong talk and are reading uh, the wrong two authors. But there's something about history that I think lights me up, and I know it lights you up. Talk to me about why history does that and why it's so important for people to read. Okay, first off, I want to say... um I'm incredibly honored to see so many people here. I, I'm from Los Angeles. I know at least half of you are here to see Ryan, but still. Um, I'm deeply honored. I live a very lonely life, so seeing all these people is pretty incredible. Um, well, you know, I... For the last, thank you, thank you. I mean it, I mean it. So for the past 28 years, I can say that I've spent an incredible amount of time with dead people, mm -hmm. right? I've probably interacted more with the dead than the living during that time, you know, all the books that I read. And so I have a very particular relationship to the dead. I'm not talking about the rock group, mind you, okay. Um, so, you know, oh, uh, first of all, uh, when you focus on what it means to be alive, I like to start there. So each one of you in the audience is alive. You have your own particular consciousness, your own sort of mindset. And it has this sort of texture to it, this day-by-day -day texture that kind of makes who you are. It's your daily thoughts. It's your obsessions. It's your patterns. It's your emotions, et cetera. And you, it's hard to qualify. You, couldn't, you can't feel it. You can't taste it or see it. But it's who you are, and you live it. And then when it comes to decisions in your life, there's moments where you could go this direction, that direction, this direction, and you choose a path. And sometimes it's the wrong path, sometimes it's a good path. I can honestly say I never intended in my life to write the 48 Laws of Power. I didn't start out at eight years old. I'm going to write the 48 Laws of Power. I kind of went like this, 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 this. And I ended up doing it, you know, by chance almost. So when we look at the past and we look at those who lived before us, they are the same as you and I right now. They have the same consciousness, the same sort of sense of time, of being in the present. They were alive. They had that little filter that made them who they were, their individuality, their emotions, their big choices in life. And so when I write about history, and I read a lot of books of history, and I can tell you 98% of them bore the crap out of me. They are so boring. They are so dry. They just list George Washington on November 4th. He woke up. He, he talked to his troops. That afternoon, he crossed the Delaware River, blah, 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 blah. It's like we make the dead people even more dead than they are, right? <laughs> so, but they're alive. They're in the moment. They're excited. They're, you know, they're dealing with the same things that you're dealing with right now. So I often think of the, the example that comes to my mind when I write, because I'm trying to, when I write about a character, to make the reader feel that they're alive, just like you are right now. I think of Julius Caesar at the moment when he was about to cross the Rubicon and enter into the Civil War against Pompeii, one of the most dramatic moments in history. And if you put yourself in his shoes, 
Here's this man who's just been through the Gallic Wars, incredibly violent, you know, with the barbarians of France, the Gauls, and all that he'd been through and seen so many deaths, nearly died. And here he is with 50,000 troops. Um, and he's, if he crosses the river, it's civil war. And he's facing Pompey, who's got an army five times his size, right? And we just think he just crosses the river and he says the die is cast and such and such. But no, he's, he's afraid. He's, he's hesitant. He knows that if he crosses, he's probably going to die, right? And lots of his men are going to die. It's an incredibly dramatic moment. And he's hesitating and he's thinking about the options. And he's thinking about where he came from, what, where this will be, and the end of his life. And then he comes to that moment where he decides to cross it. But that's like incredibly dramatic. It's not like this just fact. It wasn't like he was fated he had to cross the Rubicon. It was a choice that he made. And I want to give a feeling when you're reading books about history that these people are alive, that they're living through moments just like you. And to make history something so much more exciting and dramatic and romantic in a way. Yeah, the great biographer David McCullough, he said something that I really love. He said, you can never lose sight of the fact of two things. One, that they didn't live in the past. They lived in the present. And two, it could have gone differently. Right. And so that what we're talking about in our books, what he's talking about in his books, what you're talking about there with Julius Caesar is that he didn't have to do it. It was only a foregone conclusion after (laughs) after it happened. And so when you can see history as this sort of snapshot of something as it's happening, as opposed to something that did happen. It becomes exciting, really exciting. Yes, there's the fact that there's been the spoiler that you 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 vaguely know what happened because you heard about it in school or you know all this art is based on. But if you can go back and you're reading it and you go, no, they were really wrestling with something. There was something hanging in the balance here. And you know the great man of history theory is obviously less in vogue today than it was in the past. But but to go like if this person had chosen differently, if something had gone a little bit differently all of the events that came after would have gone differently. And so suddenly the stakes become very high and uh, you really feel the humanness of that moment right. as opposed to just a bunch of dry sentences in a book. Yeah, there's a whole series of books out called What If? Mm-hmm. And they're fascinating. I don't know if you ever read them. And so they go through history. If one little detail had turned differently all of history would have been rewritten and probably, I don't know where we would be. So one of the best examples is the Mongols under Genghis Khan, their invasion of Europe. And they were on the verge of going to Vienna and conquering Vienna. And then all of Europe would open up. And then I think it was Genghis Khan died and they all had to return for his funeral because that was their, you know, their, their religion. And so they never did it. But if they had, if he hadn't died, if he died a week later, and they had launched their invasion of Vienna, all of European history would have been completely altered. And these are amazing things to consider. And it, it's the sort of macro, enormous events like this, and then on a much smaller level, like with what I write about, I think one, what's something that struck me as I'm reading meditations is Marcus Aurelius thanks his philosophy teacher Rusticus, who gives him his copy of Epictetus's lectures, and so. If that doesn't happen, if the teacher doesn't recommend a book to the student, and then the student doesn't read the book, the book that I'm reading in this moment doesn't exist, and then the whole notion of the philosopher King Marcus Aurelius' life goes perhaps differently. And so how, how just as our lives individually can be changed by the single intervention of a person or an idea or a book at the right time, at the right place, that's also happening historically with these people that you're reading about. A single, you know, Theodore Roosevelt's father doesn't say, hey, you're, you're smart, but you're weak, and you've got to get strong. These single, singular moments change the course of someone's life, and thus history that follows. I'll take it one step further. If you hadn't come and contacted me mm-hmm. some 16 years ago, right? Mm-hmm. You wouldn't have been writing about the Stoics and had your books sure. and people wouldn't be reading about Marcus Aurelius from you right now. None of these people would be here. and In fact, they might not even exist. <laughs> I love what you said about 
living or interacting with the dead, because that's also a very stoic idea. Do you know about the prophecy that Zeno gets from the oracle at Delphi? Refresh me. He's a young man, and he's, he's a merchant, so he's traveling all around, and he stops at the Delphi, and he goes in the oracle, and he gets his prophecy, and they, they tell him, you will become wise when you begin to have conversations with the dead. And the whole point of the oracle is that you never know what they're talking about, and it's vague, and the meaning reveals itself to you later. And, and it's not until he suffers this shipwreck, he washes up in Athens, he has nothing, and he sort of stumbles into a bookstore. And in the, They had bookstores? Yeah. Well, where do they get these books? I mean, they're not, you know, your and my books, but this is where you're buying the scrolls. Uh, or the writing materials. Oh, it's a I didn't store know that. that's selling books. Yeah, okay. of course. Um, so I mean, we don't know the name, right? Is it an indie bookstore? Is it a chain bookstore? You know, we don't know. <laughs> but he, he ends up in this. He, he ends up in this bookstore, and the bookseller is reading uh, one of uh, Plato's dialogues, or I know, I guess it would have been one of Zeneca, Xenophon's books. Uh, he's reading Socrates on the choice of Hercules. And it's in this moment that Zeno realizes what the prophecy means, that you'll become wise when you begin to have conversations with the dead. That's what reading is. That's what history is. That's what books are. It's the way that these people come alive. It was, it was as if Socrates was in that bookstore with him. Right. It was as if Hercules was in that bookstore with him because that's what the power of even bad history is. But great history, vividly written history it's a chance to well, revive these, the dead. These hundreds of thousands, millions of incredibly wise men and women who lived before us, they have all these amazing things to teach us about how to live in the present, right? All these lessons for us. And to ignore that is just unbelievably stupid, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, history is a compendium of all of the most incredible human mistakes ever made. It's a compendium of human stupidity. Yes. And we have the dumbest people and the smartest people are all in books. Yeah. So there's, you know, there's so much to learn from that. And to ignore that incredible wealth that's sitting before you is, to me, kind of tragic. What's well, worse than tragic if you're in a position of leadership, if you're a parent, if you have anyone that is dependent on you in any way because you're going to be learning by trial and error or by painful experience, and they're going to have to pay that bill with you, right? So the idea that, you know, you're in uncharted territory or you're on breaking new ground, you're not at all. People have been in this exact place as you or an, an analogous place as you. Not only have they been there, but someone's been there and they did it well, and someone's been there and didn't do enough, Someone's been there and fucked it up. And how would you not avail yourself of that information? The idea of sort of starting where they left off is so vastly superior than going, well, I want to start, start from scratch. Well, there's, there's one other aspect to history, though. There's one kind of caveat there. Um, if you watch a lot of movies nowadays that are kind of historical dramas, you look at them, people are acting just like people nowadays. They talk like they talk nowadays. They're swearing, et cetera. They look like anybody that you would see on Hollywood Boulevard on Friday afternoon, right? Sure. But it's totally bogus. It's a complete myth. You know, there's a book called The Past is a Foreign Country, right? And it's true. The people in the past, they have the same emotions as us, but their cultural differences are vast. They don't think the same way. So the other great thing about history is, for instance, I was obsessed, obviously, with Machiavelli and the Italian Renaissance, but also with the French court of Louis XIV. And I really got into how it, what it was like to be in the court at Versailles. And the way of thinking and the formality and the rituals is not at all how we think nowadays. And so we're so locked into our cultural moment with our phones and our politics and everything now, that we don't realize that there are other ways to think. There are other perspectives on life. And history can open up a completely alien way of, of looking at problems, etc. if you're culturally sensitive, if you spend the time researching them. Well, there's a narcissism. You think everyone's like you. Everyone thinks the same way as you. In the same way we do this to animals, like you, you're projecting onto your dog that your dog's... That, but in fact, your dog has... What's the, there's a German word. Is it umwelt? 
You know, the, the, the experience that they're having is different. It's defined by their species. It's defined by their limitations. It's defined by the moment of time you're in. And so, yeah, there's something really trippy in the past where you can, you can see yourself in it and you go back and you feel connected to it. And then there's other parts that are so inexplicable and impossible to fully understand. And I think you, you have to have both in your head at the same time. So true. Do you know what? I'm going to give you another German word now. Okay. Ungeheimlich. It's the uncanny. Mm. That's the definition of the uncanny. Something that's both familiar and strange at the same time, like in a dream. Yeah. Something that seems like I kind of know that person, but I don't know them. And that's what history is like. Yeah, it's very true. I, I like even that it's a foreign country because people are people, right? So you travel to another country and right. they're still you. They still do most of the right. same things they do, but then they have these cultural assumptions that are so different or ways of being and and you just go oh that's that's very different and then it forces you to think about why you do the things that you do some of the things you go that's a bad way of doing it another way is why do we do it the way that we do it well um i'm for my new i'm writing a book on, on the sublime right now and i have a chapter on pagan religions and i got very deeply into greek religion and the gods and their notion of religion and gods is so alien to us, but it's so beautiful. And it's actually something that you can think about in the present and apply to your life. Their idea is gods are not these living entities out there in the sky, you know, like we see in movies. They're these kind of vibrating presence in nature that you feel kind of pass through you, an energy that passes through you. So that when Aphrodite passes through you, it creates this kind of weird sexual energy in you. But when Demeter passes through you, it creates a whole different feeling or another god or Zeus or whatever. There's a presence in the world that passes through you and takes hold of you and possesses you. But this idea of being possessed by nature, by other forces outside of us, is actually, to me, very relevant in the future. I don't believe in Zeus. I don't worship Zeus, right? But there is something actually there that when you think about it, there is some truth to what they, how they were describing the universe. Yeah, that is really interesting. Sorry, I didn't mean that. No, no, no. I, it makes sense. And and I think, yeah, sometimes we go, oh, they can't really have believed these things because we are sort of projecting our modern cynicism backwards. But they did. Oh, very much so. Very yeah. much so. Yeah, I, I describe in the book the, um, the Eleusinian mysteries and the actual route they take to go to Eleusis and the whole process. And I take you through it, and it's like this incredible drug experience, and they actually did have hallucinogenic drugs at the end, right? But the sense of being possessed by this God is very real. They believe it, and they, they take you on this journey where you actually think that you die because they put you in this situation where you feel like you've died and everything is dark around you, et cetera, and then you're reborn. It's very dramatic and very powerful and very real. This is a slight aside, but I was telling my oldest the story of Odysseus, and um, I had this weird experience where I'm telling him, you know, the story of the Cyclops, and, you know, the Cyclops asks Odysseus what his name is, and he says, my name is No Man, and, uh, you know, so I, I can watch him sort of note that, and then I'm telling the whole story, and then you get to the punchline of, you know, who did this to me? And he says, No Man, or who did this to you? He says, No Man, and and it's... and. He just starts cracking up like he gets the joke. He's laughing very, very hard. And, and it's this was this moment. It's like, here's this, what, three, four, several thousand year old joke that's landing as if I just came up with it right then. And the, the timelessness of that. And so it's so many parts of uh, the Odyssey are inexplicable, you know, as he gets there. I, it, not to spoil the ending, but, you know, he just there's just this sort of moment at the end where he just you know, murders with his bare hands, like a hundred people. And it's just like, of course he did, right? You know? Doesn't he kill he murders all the suitors? Bo bow and arrow? Well, he and his son tell him because they slaughter them. Yeah. You know, it's a very brutal ending, which I had to skip over. But the point is... Oh, you mean to your son? <laughs> yes, yes. The, the point is, some parts Why are... Why would you skip over that? <laughs> well, he's Children a little young. That kind of stuff. Le Six felt a little young to have a hundred people be murdered. Oh, um, <laughs> not for me, I tell you. Not for me. This may have been why you ended up writing The 48 Laws of Power. Someone told you some dark stories when you were six. Um, Very true. <laughs> so some parts of it beyond comprehension, and then other parts work perfectly. And that's, I think, encapsulates, you know, what it means to be. Yeah. 
So talking about the distant past, of course, but then, you know, they were in the present moment. I think one of the things I took during COVID, I, it struck me um, as someone who loves history, you know, you have these sort of, you know, I have all these moments that are happening right after each other. And I, I just had this thought, I was like, oh, this is what living through history feels like, you know, because... It, it wasn't fun to go through these, the things that I like to read about that get me excited. I, of course, know what happened, and I'm only largely hearing about the people who survived. Um, but you're like, it's not necessarily fun to live through history. That's the Chinese expression about may you live in interesting times. What do you think of the present moment we're in now? What's your, what, you talk a lot about the zeitgeist and laws of human nature. What do you think about where we are now? Well, you know, um, each, each period tends to have a kind of feel to it, right? Like the 20s, it was kind of the wildness after World War I. People are going crazy. Alcohol, sex, the whole thing. The 30s, the depression and reacting to that. Then the 40s and the war and the war years. And the 50s and Eisenhower. And we all know the 60s, you know. Okay. And, uh, and you know, I personally am old enough. I can actually say I lived through the 60s and the 70s. Right in the 70s were kind of like this great hangover from the 60s. <laughs> and then, but I think about now, and my whole thing is, what is it going to be? How are people 100 years from now going to be writing about this present moment that we're in? And the strange thing is, is I can't really get a handle on it. Mm. I really feel like we live in this time that is so weird and chaotic it's really hard to put a name on it. It's really hard to figure out what is actually going on. And I think 100 years from now, maybe they will understand it. But it's so strange. So we don't have, like, large belief systems anymore. Like, there was the war. There was communism versus the West. There was capitalism, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and all these tremendous, dramatic moments we lived through, you know, 9-11, et cetera. But what is kind of defining this? What unifies us? So in, in the 20s or the 60s, you had like um, the wildness going on, the sex, the alcohol, the drugs. And then you had the reaction against it. People were very conservative. Right. But it was kind of this one whole fabric. I can't find anything like that right now. I think a lot of it comes from technology and the Internet. Where we're all so splintered that there's really hard to tell a story about what we're living through right now. And that's kind of how I define it. I've never really come upon a moment in history that I can say about that. And I think we're actually hungering for something kind of larger and transcendent, some sort of larger narrative that we can piece together about our present moment. But we don't have it right now. Well, one thing I it hit me not too long ago, it sort of made me throw up in my mouth a little bit, but um, it was realizing that uh, I was born in the late 80s, so the 90s are sort of the first decade I really remember, and realizing that the 60s are as far from the 90s as we are from the 90s. I do that all the time. And you go, oh, wow, okay, so th the distance gets clear there, but then also sort of shrinks. And... As I think about this moment, I think you're right. There's not sort of a shared consensus anymore. Chuck Klosterman wrote a great book called The 90s, and he was sort of talking about how, um, you know, September 10th, there were newspapers all over the country, and they were all doing their own headlines about what's happening in that city, right? And then... I mean, September 10th, 2001. 2001, that, that, that every, every market was its own market. And one of the things that happens after 9-11 and then with the advent of the internet is that everything is now national or global. And so it's interesting that we don't feel like we're a part of some big thing, but actually everything is more aligned than it is less fractured, right? Because like there's not, there's less regional things, right? Every, 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 like even politics, I used to say all politics is local, but politics actually Local politics now is infected with national and global issues in a weird way. So I think there is this kind of thing where we're all in the same boat hearing and watching and talking about largely the same things because everything's instantaneous with the Internet. And then I would maybe define the zeitgeist also by an absence of anything working particularly well, like what institution, what organization, what group, of, like who or what would anyone 
describe as functioning particularly well? Like who's doing great? Do you know what I'm saying? Like what institutions are thriving? What organizations are thriving? It, it seems like a, most things are in some form of disarray or Why do you think that is? I don't know. Oh, Maybe. wise man. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, do you have an idea? A technology is obviously a disruptive force. A, a lack of, um, you know, I think one of the reasons that a lot of the institutions aren't working is that they didn't do their jobs in big moments of stress. So there's, like, they talk about young people, like, uh, you know, millennials and then Gen Z, and then it's like they don't believe in capitalism or democracy or something because their entire life it has not been functioning well. Right. And so there's this kind of uh, disillusionment that comes from never, they don't buy any of the logic or the stories or the narratives because they've only seen it prove to not, not be true. But then why aren't they kind of creating their own world, their own myths, their own narrative, a new way of looking at the world? That's what we need from this young generation. It's a disgusting world they've inherited mm -hmm. from the boomers, et cetera. And I, and I can speak that, you know, I am one of them. So yeah, you guys really let us down. Completely. <laughs> completely. I see you as Gen X, though. I don't know why. I feel like you're more well, of a Gen I'm, Xer I'm, at I'm heart. A, I'm, a, I'm on the borderline of it. You know, it depends yeah. on how I feel during the day, whether I want to. Yeah. You know. But, um, you know, if I were young, I'd be really angry. I'd be wanting something else. I'd be creating something new. I'd be creating new styles. I would be. Now, I don't necessarily blame them because it's, you know, looking at that, you know, it's easy to say that. You know, I didn't grow up in the Internet generation. I didn't have that kind of effect on my thinking. But, you know, when there should be something, there should be a real sense of malaise and anger. It's a cr critical moment. We have to create something new. We have to create a new world order here. Instead, we're just, we're creating, I know we're going to get on to this, we're just doing toys, technological toys, AI, etc. We need a cultural movement now, something coming up from the bottom that's going to rescue us in this moment. You're not an AI fan, right? No, we were talking about that earlier. <laughs> Why not? Well, you know how some foods can kind of rot out your body, how they're not good for you? They taste good, but they're not really good for you. Right. I think of AI in that way. Okay. So, um, you know, I, I, uh, I study a lot of languages. That was sort of my major in college. And I'm thinking back to the moment when I was 19 years old and I was at Berkeley. And I decided on the whim of a sudden whim, I was going to take this six week course where you learned one year of ancient Greek in six weeks. It was like the craziest thing I've ever been through, right? Every day you had an exam. Every Friday you had a final exam. You were thinking you were dreaming in ancient Greek. It was a fantastic experience, sure. right? And I remember at one point near the end, they gave us a passage of Thucydides, Thucydides, the hardest writer of all to read in ancient Greek. If you, it's, it's just non, it's just impossible to decipher. I, I can go into the nuts and bolts. It's not even easy in English. It's not even easy in English. Yeah. No, it isn't. You know, you could read a sentence like 20 different ways. So I had this one paragraph, and I must have spent like 10 hours trying to translate one paragraph. I couldn't figure it out. I thought and I thought and I thought. Finally, I go, hmm, I think this is the answer. I think this is, and I was kind of excited, and I thought, this is how it's going to work. And I turned it into my professor, this kind of crazy, hippie, classics professor. And he goes, Robert, I see what you were thinking. I see where you were going. You were almost there, but you missed it. You completely mistranslated this beautiful paragraph, but you were getting at something. And that had an incredible impact on me even to this day. It made me realize that whenever you face a problem that you don't quite understand, you have to think, you have to think more deeply. You have to use that anxiety of, is this right? No, it's not totally right. I have to go deeper into it, deeper and deeper and deeper. And I use that as a model for all of my work now when I'm writing a, a chapter or something. You haven't figured this out. You have to go, you have to think more about it, right? You don't have it right. Well, what if in that moment, 
I'd simply pulled out my translation of Thucydides and just copied the paragraph. Yeah. Or what if I had chat GPT and I just put it in there and it gave it to me right away? Yeah. My thinking, the whole thinking process would have been annihilated right there. Sure. The whole process of the, oh, the frustration. Oh, I can't get it. Oh, I'm not good enough. Something's wrong with me. Oh, I've got to go further and further and further. It developed character. It developed patience. It developed discipline. It developed self-esteem and humility. There's nothing more humiliating than facing a paragraph for 10 hours and not figuring it out, right? Sure. So you've got... You know, kids nowadays who are never going to have that that experience. Sure. They're going to be, you know, getting prompts. They're going to be. No one's going to learn a foreign language anymore because you could just go to go to Mongolia and type in a sentence in ChatGPT will give you the translation. Sure. These incredible skills that the brain has are going to be atrophying. I really fear. I fear, and that kind of process. The brain is so much more interesting to me than any piece of technology. I'm sorry. That's what we should be worshiping, not these little toys that we create. Someone was asking me... Some, someone was asking me actually just the other day about the sort of note card research system that I learned from you. And they were sort of, they were like, can you walk me through some of the pros and cons of doing sort of by hand note cards. And I said, well, the thing about the note card system is that all of the cons are actually pros, right? The fact that it is hard, that you can't scale it, that it takes forever, that your hand aches, that if you want to, if you want to put one note card in two places, you have to do it two times, you know, um, that it's physical, that you can lose like all the, all of that is actually why it works because you read something in a book and then if you want to get it from the book to the note card to maybe put it in your book or use it in a speech or what you have to physically take it from here it has to flow from your mind through it, it's this process right and and that it's hard is the reason that it works and that you could highlight it and pass it from here to there and make an infinite number of, co- all the things that digital technology allows you to do are advantages in the sense that they remove the difficulty. But by removing the difficulty, they remove the point. They re- yeah. remove all the value. Yeah. Um, the writer Douglas Hofstetter said, if you want to climb Mount Everest, right, you have to spend weeks training and training and training and training. And then you finally reach the moment where you get there and it's really horrible and the oxygen and everything. And you could die and you've got your Sherpas who might be dying. You finally get to the top. Whoa, how incredible. He said, Chat GPT is the equivalent of taking a helicopter to the top of Mount Everest and getting the same view. Or just somebody not? showing you a picture of it. It's even, it's even, at least you got that you got to see the view in, as a person, <laughs> okay. Okay. right? Like it's even, it's, you're, you're getting a refraction of a refraction of a refraction with right. these things, I think. Right. Um, yeah. I, I, you know, you were the best researcher I've ever had by far. Thank you. Right. So it was amazing. Okay. I had the worst researcher a couple years ago. Oh, he's not here. <laughs> um, <laughs> I imagine whoever it is doesn't think that they're the worst one, right? That's the Oh, no. <laughs> God, no. No. And you know what he did? I told him my note card system. What he did is he literally digitally copied passages from the books. And, and I don't know how he did it. He, like, um, printed them on the note cards. He didn't take the time to write and to think about what they might be. He just copied passages on note cards. Sure. I could just read the whole book <laughs> through, instead of going through your stupid note cards. I, you Sometimes know, I, I type the passages. Oh, uh, you're. Okay. I don't feel like it's cheating. It's still flowing through. All right, my, all right, all right, I'm all right. doing it because uh, because I my handwriting. I can't get it all on the card. Like I it. it I, it's the only way I can shrink the font down. And then I still, I print, I don't print it on the card to punish myself. All right, all right. I print it out and then I cut it out with scissors and then I, I tape it or I get one of my kids glue sticks. Aren't, I put that on. Aren't, aren't, wouldn't it save much, so much more time just doing it by hand? Well, for two reasons. No one, I again, mean, the really handwriting is, people is, with is so I can't get it in there. And then, um, oftentimes, uh, 
that can introduce it. My handwriting is so bad, I've found that I've been introducing errors, and then I have to go back to the text. So I'll get it right the first time. Not all right, always, all right, all right. A, you know. I forgive you. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a sin. That's okay. Yes. But no, the fact... The fa- <laughs> Do you ever read a book that's so good, and you're excited as you're reading it, but then also you're dreading that what it's going to take out of you at the end when you have to go through your note cards to do it in the note. I go, oh my God, this is, I'm looking at the book and it's like every page is full. Then oh, I go, I'm I know, basically going to have to know, rewrite this book by hand. I know. I, I have that all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And more often I have a book that sucks so badly that it's <laughs> not even worth half a note card. Yes. Yes. But sometimes they're worth like 60 note cards and you're like, oh shit, I got to spend like four days you know, copying that out. I know. You had a three by five or a four by six I'm guy? Four by six okay, guy. Me too, me too. <laughs> you know what I started doing? We're nerding out. You know what I started doing? This is this is this is how I knew I made it. Didn't I, I tell you to do four by six? Yeah, of course, of course. I print. I get my own note cards printed for each book. What do you mean? Like with the title of the book at the top of the note card. I, I don't understand. <laughs> Well, you, Are you OCD or something? No, no. What I'm saying, I mean, you can get your you can get your 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 regular people note cards at the store, but these are four by six note cards. These are fancy. These are like monogrammed note cards. It says the title of the book at the top of the note card. So I'll give you. Okay. So for the for the virtue series, I, I, I'm doing the the four virtue series, right? Courage, discipline, justice. Okay. So it, this is what I did for this. But actually, it was a little different than what I'm saying. So I got like. 10,000 note cards printed uh, from a printer down the street from the bookstore. Oh. And it says courage, uh, discipline, justice, wisdom at the top of the note card. And when I'm doing the note cards, I circle which book that note card is going to pertain to. Because you're researching more than one book at a time? Well, I, sometimes I'm, fine, I'm reading a book. There's such good stuff, but it's, it's not for the book I'm doing now. I will I'm use it later. And then, okay. and then I, so I've actually I've taken your system... Not for a singular book. I've had to, I have four boxes for four books. Yeah, okay. And so some of the stuff that I didn't use in the first book moves over to the second, which moves over to the third. So I'm, I'm playing, you know, four-dimensional. You're, 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 you're much better organized than I am. Because, first of all, you take only like a year or two to write a book. I take like five years or so. And, you know, I, I know that there's something in there that will be good for my next book, but by the time I get to my next book, so many years have passed that I, it's, it's just useless for me, you know? Well, I want, to talk, I, want, I want to talk about that. So first off, the reason my books are faster than yours is they're about a tenth of the length. So we're, we're running totally different rates. That's like a sprinter being faster than a, someone running a marathon or an ultra marathon in your case. I mean, I, talk to me about how do you work on something every day for five years like how do you how do you delay gratification also how do you how do you keep yourself going when i mean let's for the first year you're not even 20 percent of the way done right like i'm just trying to wrap like you don't even feel like the progress of getting closer to the end really how do you keep going well, in the beginning, you're all excited. You're like an eager puppy about to go out for a walk. You know, you've got all of this material. The whole world is open. I can read all of these books. It's fun. Mm-hmm. Then it starts getting a little bit painful after about a year. But the saving grace is each chapter is different. Each chapter is like a book, mm. right? Sure. So I'm writing a book now on what I call the sublime. The first chapter is about the history of the universe. So I'm reading all of these science books. I've read this chapter. It's like millions of years of history. In, in, billions. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, like I read a book called The First Three Minutes, which is about the first three minutes of the universe. <laughs> it's an incredible book. Very technical, but incredible. You know, the Big Bang, right? And then I'm immersed in that. And then it's over after about five months. And now I'm writing a book about evolution and the dinosaurs. And I'm going into the world of dinosaurs and animals and biology. Wow, how exciting. And then that's over. And by the end, I'm kind of drained. And then I'm moving on to pagan religions. Each chapter is so exciting and different and weird. And human nature was like that. You know, rationality, 
narcissism. How can you not be excited about writing a chapter about narcissism? There's so much material. I had so much material from myself as well, you know? It's fun. But if I had to write one book on narcissism for five years, I would kill myself. I would never make it. So the diversity of it and the, the breadth of it is the feature yeah. because it, it, it allows you to get excited about the component parts. But I can tell you when you're like in chapter five and you've got seven more to go and you go, oh man, I don't know if I can make it. You just got to have these mental strategies to kind of get you past those points, which I'm, I'm pretty good at. You know? Well, I'm trying to take this out of writing a little bit. Like when I swim, if I'm swimming a mile, which is a long distance, I get tired. I don't swim a mile. I swim like oh, yeah. seven sets of 10. Yeah, I do the same then, thing. And then I go, and then I got to do a couple more at the end, right? Like, and, and so, so what I'm feeling is not, I'm feeling like if I do one lap, oh, I'm 10% of the way done with a set. And then two, uh, okay, now I'm, and so I'm breaking it down in these pieces and I'm creating the sense of momentum, the sense of being over the hump for this smaller component yeah. part. Yeah. And so I'm never, you're not actually ever dealing with the, this sort of period of Paul Graham, who you talked about in Mastery, you know, he says there's the launch, and then he says you immediately go into the trough of despair. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I feel like if you break things up into component parts, you're actually never in the, the trough of despair because you're always just starting a set or you're just finishing a, yeah, a, short, yeah, yeah. a short set. That's, that's so right. breaking it up is a really good way to do hard things that take a long time. That, that leads me to a question I wanted to ask you. So, you know, I, your books have helped me a lot. I read them all the time. My favorite is Ego is the Enemy, but they're all really great. But I, like, struggle with these things all of the time. So I meditate every morning, and as I'm going through my meditation, thoughts are piling up, going on inside of me, and I'm going, man, that's my ego talking. My ego is talking. I'm, gonna, I'm heading towards enlightenment in my, in my meditation. I'm going, wow. If I get enlightened, I'll be so much better than anybody else. <laughs> I will be the enlightened one. And all these other suckers, they're not, you know. My ego, my ego is constantly bubbling up. Discipline, I'm always like, man, I'm so bored. I'm just going to read more about the Lakers and I'm going to get into some trivia kind of thing. I'm struggling constantly with these things. You, the great master genius of these things, do you struggle as well, particularly like with ego, which you described so brilliantly in the introduction to Ego is the Enemy? Are you still dealing with that? Well, not only did writing the book not solve the problem for me, I then had to get it tattooed on my arms as a, a constant daily reminder. So, yeah, I, th- I think I'm, uh, I wouldn't even say I'm better than most people at it. I, I would say I wrote about it because it's a thing I'm struggling with constantly, especially I think what was unique for me, particularly with ego, what's, your story is you're the sort of classic late bloomer. I mean, you wrote 48 Laws of Power. How old were you? I have to say. <laughs> no. I was 38 years old, like older than you are right now. Yeah, um, which is so different than my experience, and there's pros and cons to both. But I think, you know, my first book came out when I, I sold my first book for when I was 24 years old. Um, and then, you know, it got option to be a television show. Like there was all this stuff happened so young. I mean, even I think about what I saw when I was going through at American Apparel, like none of that was healthy or normal. Uh, and, and I think it would have been very easy to spin off the plan. So, so clearly this stuff worked to, at some level. But it also, I was, uh, the formative influences in my 20s were not people who lasted. I mean, they imploded and blew up their lives and burned out. And so I'm definitely having to think about that stuff all the time. Like, who are you talking about? Well, Dove is a good example. Oh, yeah. He's not doing so great. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but, I mean, the idea is, like, these people that I thought were teaching me how to do stuff were, in fact... <laughs> teaching me a longer lesson on how not to do stuff. Oh, you don't include me in that. Yeah, no, no, you're the, you're the last one standing. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, well, you know, success is a very dangerous thing. Yeah, you uh, say success is more dangerous than failure. For sure. Damaging than failure. Particularly when you're young. 
And it's the kind of classic scenario that happens to hip hop artists, one hit wonders, you know, they're 22, 23, they have a great hit, they've got all the fame, suddenly, they had nothing before that. And it's like a drug and it goes to their head. And they can't do anything after that. It paralyzes them. And then afterwards, if their second album bombs, which usually happens, it's a phenomenon, they don't have the internal fortitude, the discipline, the skills, the character to deal with it. So success early on is very, very dangerous. And I can say for me, I had nothing but failure until I was 38. You know, my parents were starting to get really worried about their son, right? I had what are we 50 do about different Robert, jobs. Though? I had never worked more than 11 months at one job, right? Okay. So yeah. I knew failure, man. I knew what it's like to work in the worst, most boring offices with all the worst politicking going on. So I could never take it for granted. I could never rest on my laurels and go, wow, I'm successful. It's not a drug. You know, I, I knew how hard it was to get there. And I knew each time I write a book, it could fail, you know, even at this point, I still think my books are going to fail. So having, it's terrible to wait till you're 38. It's better to do it when you're 24, but it's also a blessing in a way. Amor Fati. It is what it is. You, 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 I think I got lucky in the sense that, you know, I did a book when I, my first book came out when I was 25 and it hit a bestseller, but for a week. And then you know, I had to take a big step back when I sold The Obstacles Away. I had to take half what I'd gotten for my first book. Is that right? Yeah, the publisher basically was sort of like, well, I guess, you know, and, and they, I remember someone, someone told me they thought it would sell 5,000 copies, The Obstacles Away. And if that it would sell? That was their guess. And what is it now? About 2 million. Whoa! <laughs> but, but, you know, Actually, they looked like they would be more right than wrong at first. I mean, it sold, it did okay the first week, but it didn't hit any bestsellers. And then it kind of just dribbled along. You know, it didn't, it didn't really start taking off until it had been out for a year and it sold more each subsequent year, but there was no one moment where it just hit, right? And so it was, it was, quick, but then really steady. And so there was an adjustment curve to it. And I was too busy doing the next book and the next book and the next book to really notice how quickly it was picking up. And so, you know, I think if you're one of the ways, I think the antidote against the poison that is potentially success, like Tennessee Williams calls it the catastrophe of success, right? If you get it all at once, it can wreck you. Um, if you're just working, if you're if you're wor- working right, right, on the right. next thing, right, right. the next problem, you are too busy to celebrate. You're too busy to let it go to your head. You're too busy to say that it says something about you as a person. You're just on to the next yeah, thing. That's, 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 that's a way. great lesson. I mean, um, I think of of like let's take Dove for example. You know, yeah. a classic example. And um, this is Dev Charney, the founder of American Apparel. Yeah. And so he's an incredible entrepreneur. He's very charismatic. You know that we both kind of fell under his spell initially. And he becomes incredibly successful. An amazing story. This guy selling T-shirts out of his car in Montreal to this factory in Los Angeles. This beautiful factory employing thousands of people in Los Angeles, doing regular work, being paid well. Hundreds amazing. of millions of dollars a year in sales. Amazing story. But he can't hold on to it. Why? That success, he can't adapt. So it's the classic story of someone who's really good at one thing, and he's really good at building the company and creating the design and the marketing, but he can't adjust to the next level, which is... I'm running a large company. I'm not a good manager of people. I'm kind of crazy. I'm insane, right? (laughs) I yell at people. I'm out of control. I've got to get other people to handle it for me. But he can't make that adjustment. So your success is often makes you a prisoner of things that worked for you in the past. Well, I've often used Dove as an example. I've told people, you know, on its face, the idea is insane. 
I'm going to make clothes in America. I'm going to pay people fairly. I'm going to not put logos or branding on them. I'm going to run my own stores. I'm going to do the photographs myself. It's going to, everything that he did made it less likely that it would work potentially. Like all, it's all crazy, right? So everyone told him every step of the way, this right. is a bad idea. It won't work. Don't do it. You're and so the catastrophe of his success is that he proved all those people wrong. Now he can't do anything wrong. Yeah, and he he identifies that voice of don't do that, it's a bad idea, with those same very wrong people, and it becomes almost synonymous with haters or non-believers. And when, when they would say, hey, I think you should hire a better accounting staff, or you should bring in these people to support you, or hey... It's not only a bad idea ethically and morally, but it's illegal to have sexual relations with the people who work for you. And he's like, what do you know? <laughs> you know, and, and he's so, so the sea, the success is the seed of his own destruction. And in some ways, it's almost inevitable. Well, look, he was a huge fan of the 48 Laws of Power. He called it his Bible. Yeah. He called me El Señor, which is <laughs> deeply blasphemous. Okay, right? And so he has me on as a consultant. He brings me onto the board of directors, right? And you would think that he would trust my advice, that he was going to listen to me. Yeah. El Señor is giving him advice. <laughs> but every time I tried to tell him, no, you, you can't do that, Dove. You need to like change what worked in 2003 with young women wearing this kind of sexy 80s clothes isn't where they're at at 2011. Things are changing. You have to adapt. You have to think about what the next step is in the, in, in what's, what the trends are. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He never listened to anything I said. And yet, so that to me is like, you know, and I deal with that all the time as a consultant. People hire me to give them the advice that they wanted to hear in the first yes. place, right? So. Yeah, I remember there was one, the only person at some point who could reach him. I remember it got so bad that um, somebody called his mom and his mom came and sort of pulled him out of a spiral. He Was, was that when he was sleeping in the factory? It was, <laughs> yes. There's some Elon Musk vibes. Oh in my God, story. it's totally Elon Musk. Yeah. It's, it's, it's eerie how similar it is. It is. It's the same kind of personality trait, the same disorder, the same micromanaging, the same thinking like I can do no wrong. Even the stupidest little tweet I send out is brilliant, you know? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really weird. And I I think one of the things I took from that is a sort of a wariness of kind of like very manic energy, bad habits, lack of structure. Like, uh, obviously, I wrote Ego is the Enemy as American Apparel was pulling itself to pieces. But then the book I did after was about stillness, was me trying to rebuild my life after, out of the destruction that went going. I remember I was, I like, um, I don't know, I called someone that worked for me at like two in the morning. And my wife was like, what are you doing? You know, you can't call people. This isn't how this works. But that's the habit that I had picked up and I would watched. You know, I remember Dove would sometimes call me at, like late at night because he had to hear talking before he could go to sleep. He was, one, so lonely, but two, so dysregulated that like he he had to sort of, that's how he would come down. And it was it was realizing like, oh, that's not where... That's not where good decisions come from. The sort of manic energy to come up and then the things to come down. You, 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 you've told the story, but maybe you could um, at that famous board meeting where the decision to <laughs> what happened. Jesus, I hope he's not here today. <laughs> oh, I'm sure he came to visit. <laughs> he and Kanye are both here. Oh, yeah. um, that would be interesting. Are they you know, he's running, no, he's running Kanye's fashion company. Oh, my God. Yeah. What a pair. What a pair. What the a anti-Semite and the, and the Jewish hustler. God, yeah. Jesus. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a very dramatic moment. Wait, sorry. I did talk to someone in America. I said, um, we were both there and we've been through all those epic, like, five. I was like, how do you think their meetings go? When they sit down, who talks for five hours without break? <laughs> Is it Kanye that gets to do it? Is it Dove that gets to do it? You know, how, they must just be fighting each other to be the craziest one. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe we have to join their company again and find out. Then, then they call Elon and they just go. Yeah, yeah. 
There's, there's a movie in there. <laughs> there is. Um, Sorry. So, yes. No, no, no. no. So, the, the famous scene. Yeah, well, like, so just put yourself in this position. I'm, a, I'm his friend. He, he, we literally, we'd hang out. We'd hang out in New York. We'd hang out here. We'd go to bars. We'd go to restaurants. We were friends. Because the guy's really interesting. He's funny. He's weird. He's manic. But he's also very interesting. And he's a genius. And he's a genius. But there's a point reached where this, this ship is going down, right? And it's going down fast. And he's crazy and he's running it into the ground. And we've got 12,000 employees to look after. We have shareholders. It's a publicly traded company. We have responsibility to the shareholders on the board of directors. So we decide that we have to fire him, right? And I'm the linchpin of this, I hate to say, because as supposedly put on the board to be loyal, if I say no, then there's no way we can fire him. But I kind of go, go along, yes, we have to fire this guy. It's, it's terrible. And so we have to disguise the whole, it's a conspiracy like you wrote about, right, with Peter Thiel. <laughs> yes. We can't tell anyone because the moment he hears anything of this, we're dead meat. He's going to fire every one of us and replace us, right? So it's like something, you know, like it's CIA. So we have to keep everything secret, all our emails, all our correspondence. And then we go to New York for the board meeting where we're going to fire him. And, you know, quite nervous. You know, what's this going to be like? And Dove comes into the room for a meeting and he doesn't know what to expect. And the guy was, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie The Kane Mutiny with Okay, it's before your time. It's Humphrey Bogart <laughs> plays this captain of a ship who's literally going insane. He's like worrying about the strawberries that are being eaten in the refrigerator on his battleship as opposed to like the battles going on. And Dove was sitting here with like Nescafe, a bottle of Nescafe, and he was literally eating the Nescafe, <laughs> scoop after scoop after scoop. Of dry coffee powder? Yeah. <laughs> I would have rather him just done cocaine in front of me. That's less weird. <laughs> well, he was like putting like a little bit of water in and then eating it and then scooping it out. It was really it was disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then we fire him and he's so shocked, right? Well, didn't you? I think what's just for people who are getting a little into the weeds, but it is, there was actually a choice. Does it, does it, isn't he offered a series of choices, sort of a yeah. rational choice? The choices were, you know, uh, are you going to be fired with cause or without cause? And in one way, you 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 get wasn't the third sorry wasn't the third option you can resign and get like a million dollars a year as a consult like there was an option yeah, yeah, yeah. a rational option where you walk away the winner yeah 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 well he turned that down <laughs> right away his his decision was to fight us every step of the way yeah and then you know it's it, it's all history he he goes with this billion dollar hedge fund that he somehow manages to seduce but they're completely using him and then the company just totally falls apart and it's destroyed i regret in the end firing him because just because it didn't work because it would have been better let to have him run the ship aground and for him to realize that he failed mm -hmm. as opposed to being able to blame us for that right yeah that the problem is ultimately people don't want to learn the lessons no not from their experiences. Yeah. But I feel like you and I learned a couple lessons from it. Oh, yeah. 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 I learned. We got some good, some good books out of it, too. You did. I learned that I can be a fool, that I can be conned, that I have a weakness, that somebody, the person who wrote about con arts and the 48 Laws of Power himself was conned, was seduced by this guy. And I was brought on as basically a patsy a tool that would be loyal to him that he could kind of manipulate the way he wanted to. It was a deep, deep reckoning with my own weaknesses, to be honest with you. But you were in good company. That's something that I took from it in the sense that I watched multiple billionaires. I watched Dove give them tours of the factory. You know, they knew what they were getting into. They knew the history, right? They knew what had happened. They knew the lawsuits. They knew oh, I know. all I know. of it. I know. And each time he would manage to convince and persuade I know. the so-called smartest, best judges of talent in the I world know. I know. to give him millions of dollars. And I, I watched the ability that we have to fool ourselves. You know, in Wall Street, you go, it's different this time. 
but but also the idea, oh, it's it's going to be different with me, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and it's going to work out for the Mavericks with Kyrie Irving. Of course, it's not. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Um, it's character is fate. The Stoics would say, right? Like that that you, it's not going to be different. It's 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 in it's in the blood, you know. And and to realize how how good we are at fooling ourselves at seeing what we want to see. That's one of the laws of human nature. Yeah, it is. But I, you know, I wrote the books about that. So it's a little more galling for me to fall for it than <laughs> billionaires who sure. are going to make a lot of money out of it. Whereas I'm not going in this for money. Right. Know? So um, anyway. Well, I want to get to the questions, but I did think we should wrap up with the idea of Mortality, the ephemerality of life. It's a good way to end. As we come to the end of the talk, yeah. I've been fiddling with this memento mori ring. It's sort of the, the one of the reminders that I have this sort of physical touch. I think it's so interesting. Like in the ancient world, death was everywhere, right? Nobody died in a clean hospital down the street, you know? Nobody... Um, very few people lived all the way to, you know, old age. Infant mortality was high. The average lifespan was shorter. Um, people died in plagues and in accidents of small cuts. And then anytime you were eating animals, you saw the blood in front of you. You were cutting that chicken's head right out in front of you. You saw the blood oozing out. Yeah, even warfare. It's not you're shooting an artillery shell no, six no, miles no, no, away. No, you're you're stabbing, stabbing right yeah, in front and of you. you're ripping the sword out of them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're... It was a gruesome world, and yet it was the ancient world that needed, for some reason, to have these reminders of memento mori, that, that, that life is short, that you could go at any moment, that you're not invincible. The, the irony is we're the ones that need the reminders because we have the evidence that you are going to live longer. We have the actuary tables. We have when somebody, the slightest sign of sickness, they're taken away, and, uh, you know, they're... The, you're just not seeing it. And so I just think it's so interesting that uh, the people who need it most have the, are the most out of touch with the fundamental fact of their existence. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I've been thinking about it a lot lately because, um, as, as you know, I came very close to dying myself. I had a near-death experience. Um, so I've been thinking about it a lot lately and trying to recreate what actually happened and what I could learn from it. And my, I decided that it's not so much death that's, that's so interesting to look at. It's dying itself, hmm. the process of dying. Um, and now everybody who, who, who dies, obviously, if they don't die suddenly, they go through several weeks and they, they have to go through that. And there are people like myself who come back from the dead, literally, right? And so what does it mean to actually feel like you're, you're dying? Are we, are we going over time? No, Am no, I no, dying no, you're right good, now? You're good. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. And so, you know, I, I think about that moment. So I was driving here in Los Angeles. Anna was in the car seat next to me. And she, she sees something really odd going on. And she's forcing me to pull over. I'm like, no, everything's fine. Everything's fine. And then suddenly, like, I'm getting out of the car. Things, and I'm doing all sorts of strange things. And my whole sense of time and space is shifting. It's distorting. Like, I don't know where I am. And what seems to be like 15 minutes of me doing things is actually like two minutes, which she tells me. And so and then the next thing I know is I'm, I'm, I'm unconscious, right? And I could have easily been dead at that point. And if I'm dead, obviously I'm not here. And, um, you know, it's not a bad way to die. You just go to sleep and that's it. You know, it's not painful at all. Having a stroke isn't painful, generally speaking. You just, your blood stops flowing to your brain and you go, ah, you're unconscious, right? <laughs> and then I wake up and I'm in, I'm in a gurney with other gurneys piled on top of me. I went, what the hell just happened to me? Am I actually dead right now? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. And for a moment, I'm kind of looking at myself from up above the sky, and I'm looking down at my grave, and my mother and honor are there kind of talking about me, and I have this sense, well, I died. That's all right. Life goes on, etc. 
Not and for then, you. Huh? It doesn't go on for you. No, it doesn't go on for me. It goes on for them. Yeah. But what wakes me up is I have to pee with incredible. And then I I'm alive. All right? <laughs> I haven't died. And for some reason, I start yelling in Spanish. <laughs> Yelling, sueltame, sueltame, por favor, no puedo respirar, tengo que orinar, etc., etc. I don't know why. I'm like, my brain has been, you know, a bit jumbled up, so to speak. All right. And then the next few days, I'm like joking with everybody. And people don't understand. I'm like euphoric, right? And then, of course, a week later, I realized, no, I'm a cripple. It's the worst thing that happened to me. But I was like giddy that, for that first week. And when I think about it, you know, it teaches me something very elemental. So our idea of who we are, of, our, of the place that we live in, our whole reality, it depends on our brains. Our br brains construct this world for us that we take completely for granted. We don't realize that it's actually a construction. And when your brain goes haywire like it did for me because I have a blood clot and flood, blood isn't flowing to it, it's all an illusion. The self is an illusion. You don't actually have an ego. You don't have a self. Space and time don't really exist. They're this kind of weird, distorted mirror that we live through, but they don't actually exist. And then, then, then the most amazing thing of all is I'm alive, and I carry that with me now, and I go, it is so strange to be alive. Do you understand how strange it is to be alive? You have to understand that by first being nearly dead. But just to be conscious, just to be aware, just to realize that I'm here talking to Ryan Holiday with, you know, I don't know, 900,000 people here <laughs> is absolutely insane. History is insane. Automobiles are insane. Birds and cats are insane. The sheer probability of any of this existing is incomprehensible. Yeah. And it just made me so aware of that every single moment of my life. And I have a chapter in my new book, Awaken to the Strangeness of Being Alive. And so we should listen to these people who have, who have these amazing stories coming back. I've, I'm cataloging them and I'll be writing about them in my new book. But dying teaches us so much about how our life is actually an illusion. It's a construction and that there's something else out there. Don't you sometimes wear the shirt as a reminder, the shirt that the I paramedics... Sure do. Yeah. So when the paramedics came, I was wearing this new shirt that Anna had got me for my birthday. And I loved it. It was this plaid shirt. And I wore it all the time. They came and they like ripped it off and they cut it and shredded it in scissors, right? To get and, to your heart or... Yeah, to get to be able to, to get rid of the blood clot. And like eight months later, I, I asked Anna, where's that shirt? I love that shirt. And she told me the pathetic story of my favorite shirt. And she said, well, they actually gave it to me in a bag when you left the hospital. I go, where's that bag? <laughs> she brought me, she pulled it out, and it was in these pieces. And I go, could you please sew that back together again? I want to wear that shirt. <laughs> Speaking of memento mori, and I wear it now all the time. And it's got these Frankenstein stitches across it. <laughs> but hell, it looks very fashionable, you know? <laughs> and I wear that shirt with pride. And it's a, it's a reminder to you. But what's so interesting is you have this powerful, overwhelming experience. But with time, it, I imagine it fades a little. And you have to have things that bring you back to it, that connect you to the, the urgency of that experience. It fades, but it's, it's, it doesn't really fade. So um, it, I constantly I dream about it. I had a feeling in my bones like life was sucking its way out of me and all the blood was leaving me and my bones were getting soft, I still have that feeling. I still have a visceral connection to death, you know? And yes, it, it's faded, but you try spending five minutes tying your shoes every morning and you're reminded of that experience very graphically every moment of your life. Well, that's beautiful. It's haunting, beautiful also. So every day, totally free, we send out the Daily Stoic email. It's the largest community of Stoics ever assembled in human history. And just one Stoic idea, one ancient lesson to chew on every single day. I'd love to have you join us. If you like our videos, I think you'll like the email. It's also a podcast version of it too. You can sign up at dailystoic.com slash email.